morning. Good morning. Good to see you as we gather together. Um, I welcome you to worship here at Bellevue United Methodist Church. Uh, Mike, I will try the wireless, but you know, it's a gamble. We're working on getting a new one. <laughs> as we gather today, um, some things just make you nuts. And it's not just the wireless. Um, for the UMW, or the United Women in Faith, it's pecans. And you can ask them to what degree that makes them nuts later. But they came in this week, which is what their anxiety level's been high for a number of weeks now. Um, all the best laid plans, we took orders early, we put them in at the beginning, and then we realized we don't control harvest nor shipping. So, your pecans, if you ordered them, are here. If you would like some pecans, they have a few bags left that are $13 a piece. You will go to room 314 afterwards. That is the Judd Wesley uh, Sunday School Classroom, 314, if you ordered pecans or if you'd like a bag. Uh, and you will walk out after worship today, and they will help take care of that for you. So I'm grateful for that. Um, the nuts are here. <clears throat> take that however you need to. <clears throat> so... As we gather, uh, I am grateful for the gift of ministry together and life shared. Uh, this third Sunday of Advent, as we move through it, I would ask that you uh, be in prayer for Sherry DeVault, um, whose mother, Marlene, uh, went to be with Jesus last night, about 2 o'clock this morning. Uh, she's been on a long journey of hospice, um, and so uh, Sherry and her brother were there with Marlene, uh, and so she went peacefully, and we're grateful for that. Um, so... Uh, there are no other details at this point. I know that the service will likely be back in her hometown. Um, but lift up Sherry uh, and her family. Reach out to them and send them love and support. Even if you know it's coming, it doesn't take away the sting of death that is there. And so I'm grateful for uh, Sherry's amazing love. Um, it was a sign of God's grace in her as she went daily and would read to her and would just be there, even if she wasn't fully aware of what was going on. And so I'm always thankful for those who uh, show such care and love, but I also know the weight of that. And so um, pray a blessing upon Sherry and reach out and offer love to her. Because this is also last minute toy store season, which is the season when she puts all this energy and love into creating an opportunity for kids to have books. So she's a little pulled this, this season uh, as she was trying to do that this week. Uh, as we gather today, I know many of you saw the announcement that one of our own, uh, George Carney, uh, who had been in a severe car accident a couple weeks ago, did die this last week. The service for him, the visitation will be on Tuesday night and again on Wednesday before the service, and the service will be Wednesday at 1130. That's all happening at Harpeth Hills um, at the funeral home just down the road on 100. Um, so be in prayer for Sandy and the family as they gather. Uh, I will send out an email with that information to you, just to remind you, but that's again Tuesday night visitation as well as Wednesday morning followed by the service at 1130. Um, so prayers of blessings upon each of these families as they walk this journey. Um, as we've gathered today, um, I'm grateful for the ways that we support one another. Uh, Sharon, it's good to see you. Um, Sharon recently lost her husband, Ken, uh, who has been coming with us. Um, and so um, we, his life, we give thanks for. Um, he died this last week as well. And so we're grateful for your presence with us in worship, um, excuse me, on December the 1st. And so it's been a couple weeks. Um, but we've been walking this journey together through loss. Um, and I want to be especially mindful in this season that we care for one another, that we hold a little extra space, that we don't rush to the next thing. Um, it's tough. Loss and grief are tough. And the holidays heighten that. Um, so I would ask that we just be a little more gracious to one another, that we listen a little more closely, that we actually, when we greet one another, we look at one another long enough to pause, um, because we need that. Um, you've held amazing space for me um, as we walk through the loss of Reverend Debbie Tyree, um, our other clergy person. That hit harder than m the typical walking alongside for me, um, and I didn't realize that until, of course, at different points I've realized it, but last Saturday I felt it, and I know you did as well. Um, so let's, let's hold a little extra space. Um, in this Advent season for one another. Today is a day of joy. That's the, what, the candle that we light. Um, but as I wrote in my newsletter this week, um, one of my colleagues said, I may not get to joy this Advent. And I said to her, that's okay. 
she lost her, her father. Um, that was Kimberly Carney that said that, uh, who is a United Methodist pastor. And she said, I may not quite get to joy this year. And I said, Kimberly, that's absolutely okay. God comes to us even if we can't get to all the words we hear in the Advent season, uh, which are hope, peace, joy, and love. You may not be feeling any or all of those in this moment. My hope for you today is that the Spirit would be present and you would feel a glimpse of God with us because that's the most important thing we celebrate during Christmas is Emmanuel, God with us. With that said, let us worship God together.
Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Listen, all creation rejoices. Can you hear it? There is so much noise and chatter. Are you sure there is music? Listen, the wilderness and desert are breaking out in song. Can you hear it? It's been so long since we've heard a melody of praise. Listen, the crocus blooms with joyful singing. The very mountains join in the refrain. Can you hear it? We join our voices in hope, worshiping our God who brings forth a new song in the world. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The prophet Isaiah tells us about the joy of ascending to God's house. The, pro pro the prophet tells us to imagine being set free, being unburdened, being released to live, to fully live in the grace and wonder of life itself, surrounded by those who love us like no one else. And then he tells us that the journey to get there is just as much as a joy. The psalmist says, happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, who made heaven and earth, who keeps faith, who executes justice, who gives food, sets the prisoners free, opens eyes, lifts up, and watches over, upholds. The Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. We light these candles, the candle of joyous hope, of proclaimed peace, and of deep and everlasting joy, as a sign that we are those who walk with a skip in our step because we can see the destination and its pure joy. We are ascending to God's promise. 
Let us sing together the third stanza of Light the Advent Candle. As they are joyously moving back to their seats, I invite you to hear these words that come to us from Isaiah chapter 35. The desert and the dry land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. They will burst into bloom and rejoice with joy and singing. They will receive the glory of Lebanon, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the Lord's glory the splendor of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and support the unsteady knees. Say to those who are panicking, be strong, don't fear. Hear your God coming with vengeance, with divine retribution. God will come to save you. 
Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be cleared. And the lame will leap like the deer and the tongue of the speechless will sing. Water will spring up in the desert and streams in the wilderness. The burning sand will become a pool and the thirsty ground fountains of water. The jackal's habitat, a pasture. Grass will become reeds and rushes. A highway will be there. It will be called the holy way. The unclean won't travel on it, but it will be for those walking on that way. Even fools won't get lost on it. No lion will be there and no predator will go up on it. None of those will be there. Only the redeemed will walk on it. The Lord's ransomed ones will return and enter Zion with singing, with everlasting joy upon their heads. Happiness and joy will overwhelm them. Grief and groaning will flee away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to invite our children to come forward and meet with uh, Reverend Jack here at the chancel area. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to stand up here because if you saw me sit down and get back up, it wouldn't be very pretty. Okay, so I'm going to stand up here. What we're going to try to do is help the congregation understand the Isaiah text that Pastor Brian just read and the Matthew text that he's going to read in a minute, okay? What did the congregation do after the bell ringers stopped? playing? what they do? Well, the kids walked back to their seat, but what did these people do? They clapped and applauded. Come on, help me. <clears throat> One of the translations of that Isaiah passage says that when God does good things for us, the mountains will applaud and the flowers will applaud. Okay, I want you to help lead the congregation. What does it sound like when mountains applaud? Come on, help me, everybody. Let's be mountains. Okay, the flowers will applaud. Did you hear what that text said? When God does good things, mountains will applaud and flowers will applaud. Now we move to the Matthew passage. Guess what? When somebody is healed, God is acting. Let's all applaud. When somebody remembers those who've passed on, we all applaud because God is acting. When people who have been not hearing or listening to each other start hearing and talking to each other, what do we do? We applaud. A thumbs down? No, we do a thumbs up, okay? Hey, friends, that's what the New Testament passage says. When people like you and me and all of those in the congregation, when we do things that heal people, that love people and care for people, God is acting. When we hear those things, we applaud. Let's all applaud. Let's be mountains. Come on. Let's join in a little prayer. And will you repeat after me? Dear God, we thank you for your love. May we be your love. 
And every time we clap, may we remember you. Amen. You may remain seated as we sing the first stanza of Lo, How a Rose Air Blooming as our hymn of preparation. This hymn echoes the passage we heard in Isaiah, and we are reminded that Christ's coming is like a rose that is blooming. Let us sing together, Lo, How a Rose Air Blooming. I'm going to invite you to stand as you are able and witness to the resurrected Christ as we hear from the Gospel of Matthew. Now when John heard in prison about the things that Christ was doing, he sent word by his disciples to Jesus, asking, Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? Jesus responded, Go report to John what you see and hear. Those who are blind are able to see. Those who are crippled are walking. People with skin diseases are cleansed. Those who are deaf now hear. Those who are dead are raised up. The poor have good news proclaimed to them. Happy are those who don't stumble and fall because of me. When John's disciples had gone, Jesus spoke to the crowds about John. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A stalk blowing in the wind? What did you go out to see? A man dressed up in refined clothes? Look, those who wear refined clothes are in royal palaces. What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. He is the one of whom it is written, Look, I'm sending a messenger before you who will prepare your way before you. I assure you that no one has ever been born as greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let us pray together. God who comes to us in joyous hope, proclaimed peace, and deep and everlasting joy, may we, O God, sense the joy that you bring us this day of hope, of your promise. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. You are our rock and our redeemer, and in you we seek to trust. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the themes of Advent that always emerges in our scripture reading is this disconnect. The disconnect between what we experience in everyday life and what we're hearing in the scripture. I say disconnect because if you were listening, Isaiah 35 painted a picture of plants bursting forth in the midst of the desert. In fact, uh, the storyteller's Bible lifts up the fact that Solomon, when he built the temple, likely placed fruit trees within the garden, and when the temple was destroyed, those fruit trees withered and didn't bear fruit. But Isaiah would promise that they would bear fruit again. 
So this image of God bringing about renewal is not new to us as a people of God. It has been the message of the prophets, of the disciples, of the church. But why does it not seem to be reflective in the larger world that we stand in? Will we continue to read stories that seem completely at odds with the reality of what we see on the nightly news? And the answer is yes. Because our hope reminds us that the reason we keep telling that story is that God is not finished with us yet, and that's good news. Now, it may not feel like good news when we're walking through the midst of grief or when we fear what's to come, whether it's the economy, another conflict in the world, or more hatred and violence. But we don't lose hope because we know that God's not finished with us, and that's actually for our good. Because last I checked when I looked in the mirror this morning, I wasn't yet fully redeemed. Are you? There's still some work God's doing in me if I think of it individually, but then I also realize God still has work for us as the people of God to do, to proclaim this message of hope and, in, and love and peace and joy. Now, that doesn't mean that we say it without acknowledging the pain that is everyday life. If, if anything, my longing for the church is to be honest. Sometimes life really stinks, amen? Amen. Sometimes we have more than we can handle, no matter how many times we've heard that trite statement that God won't give you more than you can handle. By the way, if you would like to know my feeling on it, I don't believe that. Um, Because sometimes we have more than we can handle, and my hope is in those moments we realize we're not meant to handle it alone. Oftentimes we fall victim to believing that we have to do it all on our own, with our own bootstraps, even if we don't have boots. And so, as we hear this Advent season, we hear an invitation, an invitation to imagine the world as it will be. Our Advent wreath readers, just a few moments ago, uh, as William and Elizabeth read and reminded us, they lifted up and said, happy are those from Psalm 146, whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, who made heaven and earth, who keeps faith who executes justice, who gives food, who sets prisoners free, who opens eyes, who lifts up, who watches over, who upholds. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? The Scripture we read just a moment ago in Matthew tells the story that when when John's faith in who Jesus was was faltering, when he had questions in the midst of his own suffering and imprisonment, the message Jesus says, tell him this, Tell him this, those who are blind are able to see, those who are crippled are walking, people are cleansed, the deaf are hearing, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news proclaimed to them. Go tell them what you see. As a young person, my pastor would often point to the Gospel of John as an invitation He would say that when Jesus was coming and first entering into his ministry, the picture of of those who were disciples of John would see him walking and one would go to follow him. And when somebody asked, is this the one? The response was, come and see. Come along with me. I wonder if maybe the greatest invitation we can have this Advent season and really any season in life is to invite somebody to come along with us. We won't always have the answers. Sometimes we will feel the pain of death and grief and loss. We'll feel the disconnect of of our own tension in the world in which we live in. And yet, there's something about our community gathered together when we sing and we pray and we remember that God is doing something bigger than we can see that draws us back, that gives us encouragement, that reminds us that being here within the community of faith, both in person and even joining online for those who are unable to be here, matters. It matters. Generosity, a gift of time and presence. I have truly come to believe that one of the gifts throughout the, not only the Hebrew Bible, but throughout the New Testament as well is this invitation to come along and see to experience the good news that is proclaimed. 
Now that good news may not feel like great news if it means letting go of that which we are placing our trust in that's not God, but this is the encouragement we have that we see in our children. That good news brings hope. It's not something you can buy, and it's certainly not something you can wrap up and put under a tree. But that hope reminds us why we show up on a regular basis. That hope is present when we walk the journey with someone who is coming to their last days. That good news is hope when we stand with somebody who's lost everything. That good news is hope when we feel we can't lose anything else and we say, maybe you need to know how much we love you. I don't have an answer for all the pieces that the Scriptures can invite to us. If anything, sometimes I'm probably more like John the Baptist in our story today than I'd really like to admit. Sometimes I, too, send messengers to say, God, are you sure you're there? Are you sure you're doing some of the things that you said you would? I, too, recognize that doubt's a constant companion. But here's the thing I'm finding as I live into this more and more and as I've lived in this most recent season of loss and grief, God is not nearly as afraid of doubt as I am. In fact, I'm finding there's a greater embrace by God the more I lift those questions like John. The more I say, oh God, is this the one? Is this what we've been waiting for? Where are the signs of hope? Where are the signs of peace and of joy? I sat down yesterday and decided to read a nice long article on why we should be concerned about the United Methodist Church splitting. Probably wasn't the best way to find hope in Advent. But it was written by Politico, which is not a source within the church. And what it said felt a little bit like a prophet reading the kind of overall snapshot. And I'm still processing it, but I want to offer one invitation to it. In the article, it lifts up the fact that any time mainline churches have split in our history, the most recent large split that we can point back to is that of slavery. So think 19th century. That the concern wasn't that the church in the midst of that was splitting and that it should be overlooked, but was that it was oftentimes telling of what was happening in the larger culture, of the divide that was happening among people. And it lifted up how that is happening in our current day, in the 21st century, around marriage equality and human sexuality. Now, it didn't paint the rosiest of pictures. If anything, it said it's time for us to be honest about the fact of how divided and divisive we've become, and that's to our our peril. It was a warning in many ways, uh, an invitation to be reflective. Now, I have not been shy as your pastor of saying that I believe inclusion is far better and far more reflective of grace in my read of the Scripture. Now, I know that not everybody agrees with me on that, and I love you, and we'll walk that journey, but here's what I am finding. In the midst of that divide, one thing we can't be un... uh, we can't disagree on is how we treat one another. You see, one of the things that happens... (laughs) one of the things that happens within our world is when we dehumanize and we make less human, those who disagree with us, we actually destroy our own humanity. We destroy our own humanity. And the grace which we proclaim doesn't become grace at all. It becomes a bar that we expect people to live up to. Last I checked, grace is not something I can earn, but it's given to me. So, why do I raise this to you? Sometimes, as your pastor, I find myself sitting like John saying, Lord, is this the thing that will finally tear the church down to where it won't have a witness anymore? And I'm constantly reminded, as I read in Isaiah, that there will always be a highway on it where God's people will be growing and learning. And what I'm finding is that highway looks less and less like what I've ever known. It involves some folks that are kind of strange like John the Baptist they don't look the same they don't lift up institutions the same and yet somewhere in the midst of that crazy work is grace the radical inclusive grace of God that's inviting us to live more fully together than apart 
So I don't have an answer around all the issues that will likely be in the coming years, tearing apart churches and families. But this one thing I will say, I hope when I have to look at my maker that I've leaned on the side of grace. Not only grace that I've received, but grace to those I walk alongside. And in the midst of that, I think that's where we'll find the joyous hope, the proclaimed peace, and the deep and everlasting joy. I long for that to be the church. In whatever place it gathers, under whatever name it lifts up, that it never forget Christ is the one who calls us into that kind of radical community. And it's messy, amen? It doesn't fit any of the boxes we remember of our childhood, myself included. But that, to me, invites us to the kingdom of God in a way that this Advent season needs, but every season needs. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our response to the proclamation of the word is the second stanza of Lo, How a Rose Air Blooming. As we heard Brian say, our invitation is to come and see. And in this hymn, we sing that with Mary, we behold it. That Mary bore to us a Savior to show us God's love. Let us come and see, and let us sing together the second stanza of Lo, How a Rose Air Blooming. And now let us pray together, and in patience and in hope, we offer our prayers to God. For all who walk in God's holy way, those in the pews and in the pulpits, those at home and on the streets, for all who ponder God's promise in their hearts, and all who carry the good news into the world, we rejoice with joy and singing, for the coming of the Lord is near. For the nations and their leaders, that eyes may be opened and ears unstopped, and that peace and justice break forth in every land, we rejoice with joy and singing, for the coming of the Lord is near. For all the world, heaven and earth, the seas and all that is in them, for the early and the late rains and the precious crop from the earth, for the gathering darkness and the light of hope, we rejoice with joy and singing, for the coming of the Lord is near. For this community of Bellevue United Methodist Church and this community of Bellevue and all who live in it, each member of the whole body, friend and stranger, parent and child, brother and sister, widow and orphan. Strengthen weak hands, dear God, and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. We rejoice with joy and singing, for the coming of the Lord is near. For all who are nearest to you, O God, the lonely, the out of work, the sick, the fearful, the cold, and the hungry, for the one who is sorry and the one who is ashamed. It is you, O God of hope, who sets all prisoners free. We rejoice with joy and singing, for the coming of the Lord is near. For all the departed and all who remember, we rejoice with joy and singing, for the coming of the Lord is near. 
We are waiting, O God, with all the patience we can muster. Beloved of angels and archangels, lover of saints and sinners, God our Savior, to you alone we pray together as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we pause to gather this day and each Sunday, it is an opportunity for us to reflect on how God might be inviting us to fully offer our hands and our hearts in ministry um, to one another and to our larger community and world. Uh, Our offering plates are not passed through the pews, as might be the tradition, um, but are in the welcome center where you can place those tithes and offerings there. But I do want to invite you to reflect on how you might be an extension of God's grace this week. Uh, Through the kindness, through the generosity of a moment, through maybe holding a few extra minutes to be present with somebody who is mourning the loss of a loved one, of a job, of a way of being or understanding themselves. Um, I'm grateful for the ways in which we partner during this Advent season uh, with, uh, with Safe Haven Shelter, Family Shelter. That's the extension of our second mile giving that we lift up this season. Um, last Sunday, that was our communion offering. I will highlight today is the last day to bring by gift cards um, for that participation for that ministry. $25 gift cards to Target, Amazon, and... Kroger, thank you. You got me, Peg. Um, And so if you didn't bring those with you and you're going, oh, I completely forgot, bring those by this afternoon, um, and we'll be happy to work it out where you can get those in and slide them under the office door um, so that Kathy can take those to Safe Haven this week. Let's receive the joyous presence of our Alleluia (coughs) Choir.
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the main. Generous God, as we bring our gifts to you this day, we acknowledge that we have been given so much by your goodness, but we have been tight-fisted and slow in giving help to others. In this Advent season of preparation, we ask you to help us live in a new way, to walk a new highway, to set ourselves on the path that leads to a closer walk with Jesus, our example and redeemer. May this be the season when he finds the highways to our hearts prepared for his coming. In the name that is above all others, amen. Our closing hymn is number 733, Marching to Zion. We will let our joys be known and speak our joys abroad on this joyous Sunday. Let us sing together stanzas one, two, and four, Marching to Zion. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus around the throne, and thus around the throne. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. But children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King, may speak their joys abroad may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's grounds. We're marching through Emmanuel's grounds to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Before Brian says our benediction, I want to take just a moment and remind you that next Sunday is our service of lessons and carols. For those of you who are not familiar with that service, we will read the scriptures from Genesis through the Gospels to tell the story of the fall and redemption of humanity as seen through the Christmas story. Our choir has been working hard uh, for months. We will have special instrumentalist bells and piano and organ and clarinet. I hope you will come and I hope you will invite someone this week to come along with you and see the work that God is doing. Hope to see you next Sunday at 1030. Thank you, Mark. That was the note right here. <laughs> <laughs> And he did a much more beautiful job of lifting it up. I do hope that you'll be with us, even if you can't join us in person. Know that we'll stream that next week, that you can participate. Uh, it is a gift.
to be able to sing today. Would you join me in giving thanks to God for our Alleluia Choir today? I, I am very grateful for uh, its director, Gene Kells, and for Dr. Libby Cunningham. And for Sheila, um, so the ways that the three of them come together to encourage that to become a song is a real gift and joy, um, but I also know that they're coming to love Jesus as they sing those songs, amen? amen. That gives me hope, so thank you. Um, as we go forth today, I invite you to hear this benediction. One day the wilderness will blossom with flowers, and the desert wasteland will come alive with new growth. And God's glory and splendor will be on full display. With this news, strengthen those who have tired hands and encourage those who have weak knees. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong and do not fear, for your God is coming to save you. So go with confidence into the days ahead. May the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be among you and within you. Amen. I'm looking for the coming of Christ. I want to be with Jesus. When we have run with patience the race, we shall know the joy of Jesus. In him there is no darkness at all, the night and the day are both alike. The Lamb is the light of the city of God. Shine in my heart, Lord Jesus.